when we talk about a community college, right? Traditionally, a community college was often referred to as a junior college uh, with a very specific goal, which was to help people enter the workforce to earn a livable wage, right? And so that alone has already impact and sees the alignment of community and workplace. So as the years progress and we're looking at what a community college means today, they are imperative in the United States. In the US, we have about over 1,000, 1,050 to be exact, as reported, of community colleges in the US. And we service about 40% of students in the higher education field in the US. So community colleges have 40% of students um, enrolled in them. And they have basically two major functions, right? That first function is to number one, get people ready to immediately enter um, a skill type, a skill-based job, right? And the second is to give people general education foundation so that they continue in their tertiary education to a four-year um, institution. So when you're asking what's the difference between a community college and perhaps a four-year institution, it's exactly that. A community college, their degree offerings usually take place within two years, and they have perhaps other programs, certificates or less, that take less time, less than two years. Whereas a bachelor's program or university program is usually awarding a four-year degree and higher. So when you're looking at the role of community colleges in innovation, it is exactly pronounced in the name, community, rooted at service to its community. So the community college's role is to be the leader of academia, to be the leader in preparedness for the community that it serves. Looking at the governing board of a community college, um, in the United States, there are about two systems of governing boards in community colleges, right? They are statewide systems, like Raffaele said, Rockland Community College is part of the state university system of New York, right? There are about 11 of those statewide systems across the United States. The remainder of community colleges are usually governed independently and by their local governments, their local communities with governing boards or board of trustees. Oftentimes, these are locally elected or appointed officials that serve as advisors to the needs of the community and to help the community college respond to those needs. You follow me? Yes. Okay. And so that within itself depicts the level of synergy and alignment that must take place because there are so many different stakeholders that are assuring that what the needs are. For in New York alone, there are 35 or so community colleges and they're both locally or regionally based. So uh, my community college in service to our community service area might have different offerings than a community college that's 35 or 50 miles away because the needs of those spaces are different. So it's not to just say that, you know, everywhere you go, you might, you're gonna find nursing as a associate's degree or a skilled professional training. In other places, you might have nurses and you might have occupational therapy. Whereas in other places, it might have a more focus on health and human services. So it really is based on what are the availabilities and the needs of that community in order to help enhance the workplace, but also enhance the people to be productive and contributing citizens in that space. So, uh, so if I may add th something, the, the community, you know, there is a osmosis, the community directly participate to the governance decisions of the, of the institution. Exactly. And you see that not only at the level of governance um, from the board of trustees, but you also see that as far as the relationships and partnerships that you find within the community college. Oftentimes, community colleges have great partnerships with their K-12 
right, primary school through high school education systems. And that is to make sure that number one, they're offering upskilling opportunities for the faculty and administrators that they have there, but they're also the source of general education remediation for students that might be coming from those institutions to help them get ready to pursue higher levels of education. So there is a lot of reaching back in the different levels and structures of the educational ecosystem that the community college is pivotal in. Thank you very much, Fabiola, extremely interesting. Now, maybe let's continue a bit the conversation, uh, both on innovations and partnerships, uh, two words that you have just mentioned. In particular, we are very interested to learn more and hear from you about micro learning and also collaborations between uh, community colleges and university. Uh, what can you tell us and how did you see these two aspects evolve over the last few months? That is great. And I think all of us have seen a lot of things evolve, right, over the past few months um, due to that beautiful pandemic that we all are faced with. Um, but you talked to first, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the relationship between community colleges and four-year universities, right? And like we said before, with community colleges servicing 40% of higher education students in the US, what we found is at minimum, there are about at least 62% of students who were in a higher, in a four year degree, they first or had some level of experience at a community college first, right? Before they went on um, to a four year university. So at least 62% of students who have been or who are enrolled in a four year university have had some type of course or study prior to that at a community college. So that's one thing. So there's that great relationship of the transferability between community colleges and four-year universities. And just looking at the state university system itself in New York, where there are 64 colleges in total in that system, and it's, uh, it's a, almost a 50-50 parity between community colleges and four-year universities, but they have that reciprocity. Whereas once you're in the SUNY system, you have accessibility to transfer between the institutions, right? Because there is that standard of quality that we meet. So then when you go in and you talked a little bit about micro-credentials. Micro-credentials is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's, um, you're looking at, you know, four-year bachelor's degrees and at community colleges in general, we offer two-year associate degrees. And then we have oftentimes one year to 18 months certificates. A micro-credential is a credential that usually is acquired between 12, maximum 15 credits. And it's specifically focused on a skills training, but it's also about stacking up your learning. What we find is, like most institutions, right, community colleges, um, we suffer from retention right? Because when we look at the demographic of a community college student, what you will find is there's about 65 or 62 percent of community college students work, full-time students work, and about 75 of community college students who are part-time students work. That means these are people who are balancing not only education, but they're balancing life, you know, they're working, they're taking care of households, they have different challenges than you might see from a traditional four-year um, student. So what that is telling us is that we need to create pathways or different entry points for people to come in and out of a system. And so micro-credentials, that main goal is to do that, is to give the students an easier way to articulate their accomplishments and their learnings. I'll give you a simple example. Um, at our institution at Rockland Community College, we have a culinary arts program. We know that in order to run a restaurant, it's not good enough to be a chef. You could be a great chef, but a horrible business person, right? So having a culinary arts program and having embedded in it a micro-credential that is geared towards entrepreneurship or business now gives you a wider portfolio and it gives you more skill sets. So micro-credentials are really focused on that. It gives the student the opportunity to enhance their skill sets, 
articulate their learnings in a way that is demonstrable because it shows you. It goes beyond participation, right? It focuses on mastery. And it gives you more entry points to come in and out of the academic process without, without it being punitive for you, without you losing credits or being punished or said you've been out for too long. So it gives that energy or it pro provides the foundation for what we like to call as lifelong learners. And it also gives us different ways to align ourselves with workforce needs. You can imagine if you are a professional who's been in your field for 25, 30 years. Technology is changing. Workforce demand needs are changing. Are you going to come out of your job to go study another four years for a degree? Or would you prefer to have an opportunity to focus on some specific skill sets that can help enhance your work performance to accomplish your job better? This is the, what Michael Credentialing does, and this is the impediment of it. Thank you, Fabiola. Before giving the floor to Raffaele, let's just mention that whatever you, what you said is so relevant also for countries outside the UCD in Southeast Asia that are currently reflecting exactly on these challenges right now. Exactly. Yeah, th thank you, Julia. Thank you for, for, for this uh, uh, question because uh, it, it paves very well the, the way to the, to the next question because uh, uh, what now after the pandemic, you know, the, there was a crisis, the labor market have been hit, and uh, we would like uh, to discuss with you, Fabiola, the way in which you see the future. Uh, try to be uh, a futurist for us. And how do you see community colleges working with communities, but also with the education ecosystem in general, uh, to prepare uh, individuals and communities for the future of work and society after that the wave you know, hit uh, the, uh, the systems. Uh, so what do you think? That is a, you know, it's a great question and it's a timely question. And what I have to say is, you know, every day I say this, thank God for community colleges. Um, because by nature of a community college, what they are is more flexible and more agile, um, which permits them to be quicker and more responsive, right? When we're talking about um, direct labor market needs and workforce demands, um, community colleges, we have a, a smaller window for forecasting, right? When you're going to a traditional degree program, it's taking you four years. On average, someone is graduating with a US bachelor's degree in six years, right? That's the average graduation rate for a four-year degree. And the average graduation rate for a two-year degree is anywhere from three and a half to four years, okay? And so with that, what that's telling us is that we have to offer skills and trainings for today, today, right? Because if you're hiring and your need is looking for a specific service manager, it's not looking for a service manager in four years, right? And even then the workforce needs are shifting. And so the beauty of that is that what community colleges does is it focuses really on the needs of that community. It's a lot more agile and responsive and there are a lot more shorter term degrees offering. Like I talked about, you know, associates is a general degree, and then you have certificates. Now we've even layered it to specific skills and enhancement trainings when we're looking at micro credentials. So I think that the flexibility and just the fastness in which a community college can respond to the changing needs and the rapidly changing needs of the workforce puts it in a very competitive space. And I didn't even touch on the fact of the pricing at community colleges, what you're getting is a quality education at an accessible price, right? We're talking on average, a U.S. community college for a year is anywhere to thirty-five to $4,000. That is already, you know, $6,500 less than the average cost of a four-year institution. Not to mention that there is something in the United States called the 
College Promise, which basically shows you the financial aid reward that community college students are available to get. So oftentimes community college students are paying out of pocket 50% or less of their college tuition because there are grants and state fundings that are available to them. So not only are they getting a quality education, it's faster, it's directly related to employability or the possibility to transfer to four-year institutions, but it is also more affordable. Th thank you very much, Fabiola. And uh, because uh, you have been uh, working with networks of community mm -hmm. colleges in the past, so you have been experiences, perhaps, situations in which there were community colleges operating in uh, active areas, wealthy areas, dynamic areas, and other community colleges operating in areas of crisis and mm -hmm. uh, you know decline and what is the different the main difference they have you seen is there any example of a community college in a declining area that has played a pivotal role to you know drive the the economy back to sustainability is there any experience of that and do you see that this could be uh, something uh, that happens also in the near future? That is a great question. And it's, it's, it's twofold, right? As far as, like I said, as far as when you're looking at the community college, um, oftentimes it is that direct reflection of the local community. And so what you find in the community college is what you're going to see around, your, around yourself. But with that, what the community colleges do is that they bring in opportunities for, for funding, for fund development, for public-private partnerships, but also for that notion of embedded entrepreneurship. What am I talking about? I'll take example what we do um, at Rockland Community College. One of our key programs is we have an automotive and technology program. In our auto tech program, students learn and earn credits. How is this possible? Through partnerships with manufacturing companies and dealerships like Ford, like Subaru, and Maserati, they have provided opportunities not only for our students to work and train on their cars, but also to get firsthand experience in working in their service and delivery and in their automotive sales departments. So the student is not only now learning the technical trade and earning a degree, but they're also having work life experience, the real experience and building their portfolio with that company. So here is a direct alignment of where industry alignment and pedagogical alignment are directly related in pushing forward the economy of the students, right? Because you're working and you're earning credit, but the overall economy as well, because the jobs that are going to be created are going to go to the people who live there because they know that they're trained to fill the jobs. Thank you, because uh, this point, this last point on entrepreneurship education, so, and uh, this idea that entrepreneurship is not necessarily, as we say always, is not necessarily a creation of a startup, but is a question of a mindset in which you basically create uh, uh, people that are creative, that are able to be you know, autonomous, et cetera, et cetera. But at the community level, what is interesting is that you confirm something that we have discussed over the past month, in the sense that this discussion about entrepreneurship education or entrepreneurship ecosystems, when you have a, a strong level of embeddedness, like uh, you are describing in the community colleges, generates uh, a, a policy, so generate an approach to the development that is, uh, it could be almost the new regional development policy. So this idea of aligning all the uh, resources, all the capabilities that you have in a given communities towards sustainable and inclusive development is basically 
the idea of becoming an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Would you support this uh, narrative? Definitely. And the one thing that I want to stress even more is what you said is about entrepreneurship being a way of life, right? It goes beyond you actually being a creator or an owner, but it is directly linked to critical approaches, to problem solving, to managing information systems, receiving information, and then what you produce as an output for that. When we're looking at the private-public partnership that I de just described to you with the academic institution and with the car manufacturers, what that is doing is that it is enhancing and growing the stakeholders in that community. Not only the stakeholders in the academic community or in the workforce community, but it's just creating this hybrid all around them where people's decisions are directly aligned and impacting what they're saying and what they're doing. So when I'm telling you that, okay, I am training my doctors and my nurses because I know that the Bon Secure Health Facility has a need or in five years after working with their HR department, we know that there, there's going to be a shortage of nurses because of retirement or because of the normal transition, right? That right there is that direct communication and alignment is irreplaceable. That's making sure that all of us are embedded and vested in what's happening around us. It's not, oh, we're going to, let's continue to offer a nursing program, but we don't know where our students are going to go work as nursing. It's, you know what, let's recruit more students for nursing because we have the direct communication with the hospital that's telling us within five years, they're going to have a shortage. This is what we're talking about, and this is what's happening. Thank you very much. It's 3.30 in this moment. So technically, we, well, we had a beautiful performance, exchanging a lot of information exactly or less in half an hour with you. But the reason why I'm junk, I don't know if Julia wants to, to add something before we ask with, I saw that there is a lively chat. That's the reason why uh, I'm trying, I'm suggesting to move to the next session and give the floor to Anne uh, Rim and Maria Sobron Bernal. Hello, everyone. Um, I think it probably speaks to how much we've enjoyed your presentation, uh, that this is so far winning the race for the most amount of questions in the chat uh, webinar. So, you know, own that badge with pride. So I apologize to everyone. We may not be able to get to all of your questions. We're going to kind of group them together. Um, one question or a th set of themes of questions was, um, in, in Europe, we, a lot of our education systems suffer from the fact that vocational education, the skills-based education that community colleges deliver, isn't considered very prestigious. And so we, students, a lot of students gravitate towards four-year degrees, uh, even when that might not necessarily be the best suited for them or what they want because of the prestige factor. So I just want to talk about how do community colleges sort of build the prestige within their community to, to sort of be com competitive. In particular, how do you develop your relationship with uh, sort of more traditional universities and help students decide when is the right time for them to be a community college and when is the right time for them to be at a different type of institution? Great. And so that is a, that's a struggle and that's a great question. It's a great point. And I don't think that, uh, you know, your assumption is your reality, right? So I don't think it's something that is only restricted to European context. What I would say is changing the competitive C to a bigger collaborative C, right? It's the simple knowing of everyone has a role and everyone has a function and removing the mindset of there is one size that fits all. When you're looking at the benefit of a community college, right? We talked about the demographics of a traditional community college student is vastly different than the demographics of a four-year um, student, right? And that is for different reasons, because people have different desires and different end results. So it's understanding who your population of service is and speaking directly to that population of service, but also creating the pathways you know, a major function in the creation of community colleges in the U.S. was remediation, 
right? Remember I told you it started off with that junior college notion? So it was to upskill students to get them ready for higher levels of study, to go study directly at a four-year university. So that alone puts it in a lane, right? Where it's really focused on that. Then moving forward to the evolution of the community college in the support and development of its community. It's now looking at, again, upskilling, skilling for workforce needs. So I think it's about the collaboration and changing the language to ensure the fact that we understand who our stakeholders are at a community college and under letting the four-year institution do what they do, which are usually more research-based, right? Whereas community colleges tend to be more practical-based, right? For you to get some <laughs> type of, um, skills training and allowing there to be a funnel because our goal is that lifelong learning, is that lifelong achievement. We want to have people who at 76 say, you know what, I've been doing this for all these years, I wanna try something else, why not? Why should you not have access to do that? Or someone who did not go to school at all and are looking now to re-enter into school and to pursue a degree. Why should you not have that experience? Or maybe you don't have the option to go away to school. You have to stay home, you have to stay local. So why shouldn't you have access to a higher education, right? So it's understanding the population and being flexible enough to speak to those populations and working collaboratively with four-year institutions. So the level of prestige, the quality, we just say this, like the quality of instructors that we find at our community college, because by default in community colleges, what you're going to have are real practitioners. You know, you might be learning in your marketing class for someone who is a marketing person who's working for a big fortune company, right? So they have that practical experience. They're not teaching you, you know, Peter Drucker from the textbook. They're teaching you, Peter Drucker, this is how I use social media to turn my company around. And so those are the differences, I think. So it's about collaboration. Thanks very much. I think Maria's got the next question. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabiola. And just to continue on, on how you create the, reput uh, the, the reputation for collaboration, we were run, wondering for micro-credentials, are they accepted by the industry compared to more traditional credentials? What is the role of the industry in the curriculum development? So it's twofold, right? And when I say twofold, we're going to look at micro-credentialing from number one, the student advantage, and number two, how institutions now have the opportunity to work with and align with industry-led professionals. So from the student perspective, the first priority is that badging of the credential and the articulation of it. Most micro-credentials are something that um, is demonstrated by an achieved badge, and it's linked to a mastery of a skill set. So it gives the students something to perhaps enhance their curriculum vitae or their resume, or to demonstrate on a digital portfolio, right? So what we've done at our institution is that in the creation of our micro-credentials, it has always been in alignment with what we have industry advisors. So in the creation of the credential, it's not faculty in their own silos saying that, oh, this seems like a good thing. Oh, let's credential this, right? We have our researchers that have looked at local industry trends for employability and job market placement, and we've utilized our boards. We've utilized our stakeholders, and we've invited industry leaders to come into that participation with us. Hence how we have, like I said, the, um, the auto tech lab that is sponsored by Ford and the different lab by Subaru. It is in that alignment of those community conversations where people who could actually give you a job are saying in my workforce, this is what um, skills gaps that we have. How can you help us close those gaps? Okay, thank you. Very interesting. And just uh, like a follow-up question, 
so the industry, uh, the industry representatives are involved in the governing board, correct? Are involved as advisory board. As advisory. Yes, when we're putting together the micro credentials. So Perfect. we will have experts that we work with, yes. Okay, thank you. I think we're back, we're back to me again. Muri and I are ping-ponging along. No. Um, and, and, and this was one question, and, and I'm going to directly stealing from somebody but whose name I've lost in the chat, so apologies. Uh, and she was asking about, uh, you know, you've talked about the importance of community colleges being able to quickly pivot and adjust to mm -hmm. labor market needs. Uh, but also community colleges don't necessarily have the same sort of budgets and resources that big uh, HEIs do. And particularly those maybe in rural areas or disadvantaged areas, how do you sort of pivot that balance between potentially having very limited financial resources to also having to be very adaptive and very and, and having the ability to quickly pivot and alter programs as the labor market evolves? And that's the beauty, I would have to say, of innovation at a community college, because it happens throughout the course of it, right? You have to be creative and you have to be intentional which is a reason why we spend so much time developing those relationships and really deciding on where we're going to allocate our resources because the opportunity and the margin for error is that much slimmer, right? And so our programs offerings, we have to be sure that we're gonna have students enrolled in those program offerings. It's not, oh, you know, this would be fun. Let's have graphic design for bird watchers. Is, is that really a need? <laughs> You know what I mean? And are, are people going to not only enroll, but after they enroll, how many? Where are they going to go work? Where are they going to transfer to? So that's why that intentionality um, in alignment is so important at community colleges, and it happens at such a higher rate. And that's also the reason why, again, those alignments, because, for example, our institution, um, we just won our second Title V grant. Um, Yes, our second Title V grant. And so we were allocated um, $500,000 over a, a year, over the course of five years, particularly to work on workforce readiness and job placement. And this is the second one that we've won this year. And so that goes to show, well, number one, the, um, the vote of confidence that the state has placed on us as far as the work that we're doing, as far as assuring the quality of community development, and as far as assuring the fact that the work that's taken place, the academic transference that's taken place at community colleges is what's needed to help promote and stimulate our economy. I, I could keep going, but um, <laughs> I know that, that at some point, Julia and Raffaele may, may just cut me off, but, but Clearly, we're not at the Oscar level music uh, yet. Uh, so, so I think I think linked to that is you're just talking you're talking about you know the importance of sort of those grants being votes of confidence from the state government that you know your your community college is on the right track. And I, one question we had was sort of what is the relationship to community colleges to to state government to, to the federal government, but also um, I think linked to that is is that. For all that you said, we, we, know, we need to move away from dialogue about competition to collaboration. You know, there is clearly, it's a competitive system. You know, you, you're competing against other community colleges, other uh, training. And, and I guess my question is, is that how does that sort of landscape that, that maybe sort of public funding isn't as sort of can't be taken as a given and you've got to sort of compete for both students and public funding impact your institution's ability to be innovative? That is a good point. I think, um, that is the direct correlation, not in our ability to be innovative, but it is our quality measure, right? It is the type of that eagle eye that's watching to make sure that at every step we're evaluating and re-evaluating and putting in the right measures to making sure that we are holding up our end of the deal to the community. Right there, there is this notion, and it's it's a traditional, you know, notion in academia. Like they say, the client is always right, but the school is always right. Right, my professor said, or this is what has to be done because they stood up in front of the class. But we have to step away from that. We have to make sure that not only are we, you know, holding up to the changes in the economy, but we're also, you know, holding up to the changes of our students and their needs and approaches to pedagogy. So there has to constantly be those 
overarching systems of checks and balances to make sure that everyone is doing their part to make sure that in our classrooms that it is integrity it is ethical right there is all those notions that are going to promote that type of academic exchange that we're looking for and so that is what those things are there for i think because it's not just it's not you know it's not free money right it's not given money you have you have to earn it and you have to continuously demonstrate with your with your rates that yes you are doing what you're supposed to be doing you are doing the right thing and there's always room for growth and continuous growth with that so that's how i would think of it sorry I'm just taking taking down all the notes so i can preserve all the genius uh no th this is this is i think it's really fascinating and i think that that relationship between uh government sort of supporting innovation without smothering it is a really difficult balance uh, for, for national governments to, to strike and, and, and figure out how to, how to kind of give that space. Um, Maria, do we have one last question? Raffaele, are we still good for time? Yes, uh, so we have one last question that is more related to entrepreneurial teaching. So coming back a bit to, um, to specific entrepreneurship, but do you think that in this context, uh, entrepreneurial teaching classes will help graduates find a job more easily? You know, what I love to think about it is I always go back to entrepreneurship thinking, right? Um, it, it goes into those kind of, it's a merge to me of those critical hard skills and traditionally what we've identified as soft skills, right? And so with that, I think of it not as more or less of finding a job, but as far as understanding that they have all the skills and resources to create work, right? Because oftentimes it's like everything, you know, there, there are different people who think they have an express need. And that is because they don't know yet what you can bring to the table. They don't know yet how you can perhaps take a different program and enhance it for them. So I think that entrepreneurship, it takes the student and it takes them out from just a consumer and it actively puts their mind in a productive state. And that productive state is not only based on what's happening in the classroom, but that productive state is all of their interactions that's taking place in their lives. So that's outside of the classroom as well. That's personal relationships and friendships in their workplace and really putting them in that, well, what can I do to make this better? What value can I add to this situation instead of that, again, well, they told me to do this. I have to do this. Well, this is what, no, but taking initiative, right? Being critical, not only in their decisions, but in processes that are taking place around them. So it puts them at a different level of thinking and of thought.